please give a big, warm NPS welcome to our friend, our neighbor, our Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta. CFR has been a dear friend and someone that uh, I've worked with a long time uh, in a number of uh, positions. Sam was uh, first on the Board of Supervisors and served in the Assembly, and obviously now uh, serves in the Congress. And he has been someone who has been incredibly important to uh, this area in uh, protecting uh, the military establishments that are here. And uh, I thank him for the support that he has provided the military and his, his continuing support for the mission of the Navy Postgraduate School, uh, the Defense Language Institute, and the other installations here on the peninsula. Uh, he has been, he's been a true supporter. Uh, Dan Oliver, uh, great to, to be able to see you again uh, and uh, have a chance to visit here. Uh, this is a this is a special place for me, uh, and uh, in many ways, it's coming home. Uh, I am very proud of the Navy Postgraduate School, proud of its mission, uh, and proud of its dedication to protecting this country. As Secretary of Defense, obviously, every day, I look at a myriad of challenges that face this country. A range of security challenges that come from a lot of different directions. And as a, re as a result, require the kind of leaders who are knowledgeable, who are creative, who are strategic, who understand the steps that have to be taken if we're to protect this country. One of the great thrills I have each day is to work with Mike Mullen, who is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who happens to be an NPS graduate from the class of 85. And he himself has called the postgraduate school, a national and international treasure. And it is. The strength of our democracy, at the core of what a free society is all about, is the willingness of those who are part of this country to serve it, to give something back, that was true for our forefathers. It was true for the pioneers. It's true for the immigrants. It's true for the men and women who have served in uniform throughout the years, throughout our history. The willingness to give something back to this country, to serve this country, to try to serve future generations. There's a great story that I tell uh, because it uh, makes a point. When I, uh, when I was a boy, and, and uh, you know, those days, my dad went around with a pole and hook and shook each of the branches of the walnut trees, and my brother and I used to be underneath collecting the walnuts. When I got elected to Congress, my father said, you know, you've been well trained to go to Washington. <laughs> because you've been dodging nuts all your life. <laughs> Pretty good training. Pretty good training. Obviously, our hope is that for all of those, for all of those who served in those areas and continue to give their lives that we will do everything we have to do to prevail in those wars and to ensure that both Iraq and Afghanistan are stable governments that can govern and secure themselves for the future. 
and ensure that they never become a safe haven for those who would attack those countries, but more importantly, attack our country. As we all know from the headlines, we continue to have been involved in a NATO mission in Libya. And hopefully that is a mission that is beginning to draw to a close. The opposition forces uh, have obviously made significant gains, but the situation obviously remains very fluid. We are continuing to monitor events there, but as the President has said, in many ways the future of Libya is in the hands of the Libyans. Even though we have made significant progress in weakening Al-Qaeda, as we approach the 10th anniversary of 9-11, we recognize that because of a number of efforts here and operations, we have weakened Al-Qaeda's leadership. We have weakened their capability to be able to plan attacks in this country. But they still remain a threat. And now is the time to continue the pressure against them. Not to lift it, not to walk away from it, but to continue the pressure. The proudest moment I had as director of the CIA was being able to work on the operation that took down Osama bin Laden. It was an example of our intelligence and military communities working together to go after an important target and to succeed. But the reality is that Al-Qaeda still continues to operate, particularly in what we call the nodes, places like Yemen, and Somalia, and North Africa. And we must never stop until we have been able to ensure that they have no place to hide and that they no longer represent a threat to this country. We continue to have to deal with the threats that emerge from what I would call rogue nations. Places like Iran and North Korea that continue to try to develop a nuclear capability and to undermine and threaten stability in those areas of the world. We now are dealing with cyber threats, another challenge that confronts us. In many ways, I've said, and I believe this is the battlefield for the future. We are now the target of literally hundreds of thousands of attacks every day. The capability to do cyber attacks is growing throughout the world. Countries like China, Iran, Russia, others are developing that capability. And I truly believe that as that technology increases, as that capability increases, the ability to paralyze this country is very real, to take down our power grid, take down our financial system, take down our government system, to create the kind of paralysis that would indeed be comparable to a Pearl Harbor type of attack. We have got to be ready, not only to defend ourselves, but to be offensive in, in being able to go after those that would threaten our country in the cyber arena. All of that combines with the situation in which we face rising powers throughout the world. China, India, Brazil, not to mention the continuing focus on Russia. Ensuring that we try everything we can to cooperate with these rising powers and to work with them, but to make sure at the same time that they do not threaten stability in the world. I am not one 
having worked on budgets for a good part of my career. I am not one who believes you have to choose between fiscal responsibility and national security. I think we can implement fiscal discipline in a way that protects the national defense. And that's what we're working to do. But there is a greater danger out there. There is a greater danger. And the greater danger is that for some reason because of Congress's inability to be able to develop the kind of deficit reduction proposals that they're being asked to do, that they have fashioned what I've termed this doomsday mechanism of cuts across the board, the so-called sequester, uh, in which if the committee fails to do its job, then what that will trigger is a sequester across the board, cuts across the board, that could result in as much as 500 to 600 billion dollars more in defense cuts, doubling the number of defense cuts that we're now dealing with. This is a moment when in many ways the leadership of our country is going to be tested more than it ever has. If it's serious about dealing with the deficit, serious about dealing with the deficit, and I speak as someone who was involved in every major budget summit, going back to the Reagan years, the reality is you cannot balance the budget just focusing on discretionary spending. You can't. Discretionary spending makes up about a third of the federal budget. Two thirds of the federal budget is in mandatory programs. So if you're serious about reducing the deficit, you've got to focus on that two thirds of the budget plus revenues if they're serious about trying to reduce the deficit. But I have to make clear, I have to make clear to the American people and to the leadership in Washington that if it fails to do that and it results in this sequester, even though the sequester is supposedly not to take effect till January of 2013, the reality is that it will be devastating to the defense budget. It will hollow out the force. It will weaken our national defense. It will undermine our ability to maintain our alliances throughout the world. And most importantly, it will break faith with the troops and their families. You, by your presence here, make very clear that you are willing to fight for that American dream that brought my parents to this country, for the dream of making sure that our children have a safer and better life for the future, for the dream of making sure that we always keep in our hearts the sacrifices of those who gave their lives for this country. But most of all, that we always fight to ensure a strong government of by and for all people. Thanks very much for having me.